Thank you very much, Ramon. I'm very happy being back. Uh, I think last time I came, we spent one and a half days locked in a room writing the paper. <laughs> we did not do a bad job. <laughs> so I'm also happy to have a seminar at 12 o'clock, which means we don't go for lunch at 12. So I feel that I'm back in a Mediterranean country. That's, 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 that's always nice. So uh, I'm going to give you an overview of our activities, everything related with germanium. And uh, I have included a bit of everything, so I hope there is something of interest to each of you. And uh, since I'm invited by a theory department, I will start with the zero-level Hamiltonians I know. So, <laughs> so we are working with holes. Let me tell you what I believe I understand about holes, though every year I realize that I still don't understand anything. But that's the way to go, I guess. OK, yes. So if we recall university times, I think we all have seen uh, the band structure of a semiconductor. That's now germanium. And uh, OK, if we focus to the valence band, since I'm going to be speaking about holes, we have heavy holes, light holes, and split off band. That's what we learn at university. How much we digest of it, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, in principle, we all have understood it. And then you start doing experiments to realize that actually you did not understand anything, or I did not understand anything. So let's see what is now the difference between this thing, which does not seem so scaring compared to that thing. The difference is that if you check for electrons, the Hamiltonian uh, is very easy, even for an experimentalist. And the important thing is for a system with very weak spin orbit, there is no correlation between the orbital motion and the spin degree of freedom. That already changes if you think about bulk and holes. So because uh, now you start uh, dealing with a Lattinger cone Hamiltonian, which I cannot derive, that hurts me. But whenever I try to read the original paper, I realize of my limitations. But so let, let's believe that that's really the Hamiltonian which describes the top of the valence band. This is already uh, written down for germanium in the so-called spherical approximation. So gamma 2 is equal to gamma 3. So that's already a simplified version. But already here, there is one important consequence that in bulk already the spin degree of freedom, and I actually should speak about pseudo spin, correlates with the direction of motion. But the thing becomes even more interesting when you add confinement, because as an experimentalist, or nowadays you don't work with bulk materials, but you work with confined materials. So uh, let's see about the, the mass. Because here you learn heavy holes and light holes. You say, OK, that's, that's bizarre names. Why are they heavy holes and why are they light holes? Let's stay still in bulk. So if you apply the Hamiltonian on, uh, on so that's, that's the y direction. If you apply the Hamiltonian to the eigenstate, to the plus minus 3 half, which is called the heavy hole state, uh, with a few lines of uh, calculation, well, it's very straightforward, <coughs> you find out that for the plus minus 3 half state, that is the mass, so it's m effective divided by gamma 1 minus 2 gamma s. While if you do the same thing for the plus minus 1 half state, which is the light hole state, uh, now the mass is m effective divided by gamma 1 plus 2 gamma s. So it makes sense that the heavy hole state uh, is called heavy hole because it has a heavy mass, and the light hole state is called light hole because it has a light mass. But that changes the moment that you put confinement. So now, uh, just be aware what people call heavy hole states will not correspond anymore to the state with a heavy mass. It is just the state which is plus minus 3 half spin projection. So we now add confinement. Yes? Yeah, why, why did you say before that you talk about a pseudo spin instead of a spin? Because uh, due to the strong spin orbit, in the end, it's, uh, it's J. So for, uh, for the conduction band, L is equal 0. So J is equal S. So practically, you have the spin. For the valence band, L is equal 1. So actually, what we call spin is J. So it's we, a generalized uh, angular moment. 
Yes, yes. And if you write down the, uh, the spin up, actually the spin up is spin up and spin down. So this pseudo spin is actually not the real spin and it has contribution both from up and down. So what happens now if we add a, a confinement uh, in this very artistic scheme, we add a confinement in the z direction, the Hamiltonian changes and uh, since kz is now much bigger than kx, ky, you already see that the pseudo spin will be pointing at the z direction. So if you now apply the Hamiltonian to the eigenstate plus minus 3 half, actually you realize that now the heavy hole state has a light mass. So that's already just by adding the confinement, you invert what is a, what is a heavy in mass and light in mass. And that's actually nice because it means in the transport direction now our states have a lighter mass, which is good uh, when you do nanofabrication that you are less limited by, by problems that uh, you would need to do your dots very small. So once more visually, what happened? We added a confinement. Now our pseudo spin has actually uh, rotated by 90 degrees in a, in a very naive picture. And obviously also confinement leads to a splitting between heavy holes and light holes. And as you see in this picture, in the transport direction, your heavy hole actually is light. So what is a whole spin qubit? How do I understand a whole spin qubit? That's an electron spin qubit, as at plus minus one half, whether you are in the zero state or in a one state. And if you now think of a, of a whole spin qubit, uh, and since uh, in compressively strained systems, like the ones which experimentally typically work with, the heavy hole is higher, which means energetically favorable, uh, the whole spin qubits which are around so far are heavy hole spin qubits, which is a heavy hole Kramer's doublet. So you have either Jz plus or minus 3 half. But in some sense, if you then are an experimentalist in a first approximation, is a two-level system. Just it's not spin plus one half, minus one half is Jz minus three half and plus three half. And if now you would look at the whole wave function, you will see that it's actually a superposition of spin up and spin down states. That's why I call it pseudo spin because you see that the wave function of let's say pseudo spin down has a component spin up and a component spin down. And that makes things complicated and interesting at the same time. And that's why for me, a hole is not just a missing electron. So when you do transport, you will observe a couple of features which you would not anticipate for electrons. And uh, one interesting thing uh, also for heavy holes is the, the direction of the Overhauser field is very well defined. So it's in an out of plane direction. So in principle, you know that if you want to make a good spin qubit, you should put your magnetic field in plane. Or recently, the group of Daniel Loss suggested that by squeezing, you could mediate away hyperfine interaction. So there were many ideas, there were many proposals that maybe actually <coughs> holes could be good spin qubits. To be fair, 20 years ago, among theorists, there were theorists who were believing that the coherence time would be a picosecond. And there were others who were more optimistic that it would be a good system to study. Luckily, the optimistic theorists uh, were the ones which, uh, which were right. And uh, what I've been speaking so far was in general about whole spin qubits. So now why is germanium interesting? So if you, if you list up the properties, so germanium is a strong and electrically tunable spin orbit. The effective mass is small. So if you look now about effective masses, so uh, heavy hole uh, and uh, you compare silicon and germanium. So you see that germanium has a lighter hole. And actually, as I told you that the heavy hole state is actually in mass almost light, uh, the mass is pretty low. And that value has been uh, recently confirmed by the Delft group, Giordano Scapucci has done a measurement. So indeed, uh, the states we are investigating has a mass of roughly 0.04. Maybe just one more for theories. That's very important because it means that if your, if your uh, valence band is not perfect, 
but you have uh, a lot of disorder, you want to make sure that your state is as up as possible and that how do you do particle in the box if the mass is low your state is high in energy and that allows you to do bigger dots uh, compared to silicon without suffering of, of the disorder which there will be it will always be in the system so the other thing is it has germanium has large G factors what we hide from from people when we write proposals of course is actually that's not really true it has large G factors out of, out of plane, but in plane it has low G factors and that's a challenge which we are trying to address because when you want to do hybrid systems, typically you will need to put your magnetic field in plane. So and in plane our G factors are more 0.35 and we are trying to find ways how to, how to mitigate that problem. Uh, we can purify it, silicon can do the same. And the last thing is uh, Planar germanium has shown very high mobilities. Actually, last week, the group of Giordano Scapucci uh, put on archive uh, the first uh, germanium heterostructure which, has been which is grown on germanium, which has the advantage now that you have less defects, and they have reported a mobility above 3 millions. And by discussing with him, I think uh, they will be able to go to 10 millions. So, which means that uh, the material is getting better and better and uh, we might be able to compete with gallium arsenide one day. In terms even of quantum hole physics, because for dots, one more uh, important point, nobody cares. 10 millions or 100,000, your spin qubits will not be influenced by, by that value. It's a, bit, uh, it's a completely wrong value to give because the mobility is given at high carrier density. When we do quantum dot physics, we deplete completely the carrier. So, just be aware there is no correlation between the mobility and how good spin qubits you are going to do. Okay, so my groups, well, to be fair, I've been working all my life on germanium with the deviation on indium arsenide, the work I did uh, with you guys here. So as a PhD student, I did uh, surface science. I worked with self-assembled germanium quantum dots. And when I finished, uh, uh, I took these type of waivers to Grenoble and we started doing transport on germanium nanocrystals because it was the time that some people suggested that germanium could be an interesting platform. So when, when I started my own group, I was still working with uh, self-assembled uh, materials. So, and we said, okay, let's try to make a, a qubit to see if actually a germanium qubit is good or not. So this is a schematic of a device. So what you see here in brown, it's nothing else than a special type of nanowire. It's not important. The difference to the conventional nanowires, the nanowires typically are round, they are cylindrical, while that one has a triangular cross section and a height of two nanometers. So it's an extremely tiny object. So they are called hot wires because they come from hot clusters. So these are three dimensional nanocrystals, which you, if you anneal, they elongate. And the ones they elongate, you can form a double dot. So you have a source contact, a drain contact, and then you have two gates. The gates uh, have an effect that below you form automatically a quantum dot. We are not exactly sure what's the origin, whether it's just strain or whether it's a, it's a most capacitance effect. But the important thing is that just with two gate voltages, you have a double quantum dot that's the scanning electron microscope picture then you can form a double quantum dots. Uh, these features are not as nice as you see in, in planar germanium because we have no way of, of tuning barriers. So uh, the advantage, uh, yes, very few gates. The disadvantage, if you want to do advanced experiments, uh, you depend on luck. Uh, you fabricate, you measure, and then if the tunnel barriers allow you to do an experiment, great. If not, uh, uh, your device tells you what you can do or not. Nevertheless, uh, my people were very patient tuning up the device. And uh, just to give you a feeling, Hannes was looking for six months for the electron uh, dipole spin resonant feature. An extremely patient student, I'm really grateful. So that we managed to, to really be patient enough to try uh, diamond by diamond uh, bias triangles because we could not count the number of holes. We did not know whether we were in a correct configuration, so then you are a bit blind. You go step by step. But okay, once, uh, once we could do that, effectively we managed to do the first spin qubit. And I don't want to, to 
insist too much on that, uh, on that graph. I think the important thing is that we managed to see that the T2 star was not too bad. It was not gigantic, but for a first experiment, it was ranging between 100 and 200 nanoseconds. So that already was a decent starting point. And that the Rabi frequencies actually indeed could go up to 150 megahertz. Because everybody was saying germanium strong spin orbit coupling, very fast qubits, but uh, was it true? Yes, it is true. And maybe just to let you know, last week, a, a group in China who works with hot wires reported 1.2 gigahertz Rabi time. So indeed, the strong spin orbit has an effect, as theorists have predicted. So what did this experiment uh, uh, show us? So the takeaway message we got is that, yes, germanium is promising for doing qubits. You can do very fast spin manipulation. You have decent spin dephasing times. But, OK, that is the thing which uh, is a problem that 1D geometries have serious limitations the moment that you want to go to more advanced experiments. And by advanced experiments, I don't mean at all scalability or uh, anything related to that. But the moment you want to put a chart sensor on a nanowire, it is a pain. And I'm telling this to you, we tried to do it. It took us one and a half years by putting a, another hot wire perpendicular to the first one. But it takes so much effort. It's nothing which allows you really to, to focus on physics rather than focusing on how to put nanowires close to each other. So what's the solution? The solution is to go to work with planar devices. And actually, my group started to work on planar devices already in 2014. While we were, uh, while we were trying to do qubits on the hot wire, it was clear already from that time that the way to go if we want to do more advanced experiment is to go to a 2D platform. Yes? Yes. They are Stransky Krastanov. Uh, I don't know if you have heard. Uh, so it's, it's strain driven. So you start with a silicon. You know, if you grow slow enough, you have two to three monolayers of strain germanium. And then somehow the system needs to relax strain and you get crystalline structures. Where? But wherever, yes, that's the thing. It's not that you can. Uh, that you can position. And then you, you, know, you take SEM pictures, you localize them, and then you do E-beam lithography and all the rest. Uh, so we don't transfer the nanowires. This is the difference to, let's say, uh, the indium arsenide nanowires we were working together. And what was the advantage? Why, why did you want to use these nanowires instead of going directly to the Because, uh, OK, you need, to, you need to start with some material, right? And uh, that material, I had been working myself as a postdoc very much. I knew the people. But you said that it also had some advantages. Look, OK. So Look, the, the advantages in, uh, yes and no. In principle, uh, the advantage is that you, you just put a metal contact on top of your uh, nanowire, and you have a, a contact. Well, with germanium, it's not exactly so easy, but in principle, it is, uh, it is less development of, on the fab in a first step. But on the long term, uh, that does not help you. And, and OK, then you need to get access to good material. And until you develop good material, and nowadays you, you have 10 growers uh, of, of planar germanium, but at that time, there were not 10 growers. Germanium was big in the 1990s when people were thinking of uh, creating uh, cool devices in germanium there were many growers but since nothing happened they switched them off so when it was 2015 uh, the group of giovanni zella uh, is a group which grows germanium since 20 20 something years i reached out and then we started again uh, working on that but the material i knew we started from the material i knew so in some sense, you need to start getting results while you work on parallel to, especially when you are young and the pressure of uh, producing. You need to show that you, you exist. So th th that, that, was, that was a bit the parallel path, how the group was set up. We do, and we were lucky that we managed to get a decent qubit because it could have been also. Uh, so I'm really grateful to the people who really passed a tough time. OK, we tried. But what we realized is that then you would form another dot there. 
So we ended up in random dots and it was a zoo. So then the conclusion was that's the easiest way at least to reproducibly get double quantum dots. So you get through accumulation to uh, Through some band bending. We don't know. I don't want to make any statement. We just know they are there. I don't know why they are there. Is it strain? Is it... By experience, we, saw, we started with five. And then we, we did not know what to measure because once you have five serial dots and you measure transport, you don't see anything. So, and then, you know, step by step, we realized actually we had five dots and not two, and we started reducing. Yes, with the limitations of... Uh, and, uh, okay, I don't need to tell you that Delft has published uh, amazing uh, results on planar germanium. So, in 2020, they, they showed a, a double quantum dot, uh, no, sorry, two dots, so they could uh, do a two-qubit gate. In 2021, they, they showed a four-qubit uh, entangled state. And last year, they also started doing some algorithms for uh, uh, error correction. And, uh, okay, then our idea was they have done Los Di Vincenzo. Let's try to see if we can do singlet triplet qubits in, in Germanium. And, okay, that's the material we are working with. These are the people who are helping us. So that's Stefano, Andrea, Dani, and Giovanni. So Giovanni is the head of the group. Uh, you start with silicon, then you slowly increase the germanium content because uh, here it will be full of defects. You cannot grow. The, the, mattis, the lattice mismatch between germanium and silicon is still very substantial. So, uh, so that part which looks here uh, smooth is full of defects. Then you reach a concentration of 70%. Then you grow two micrometers. So that's now the clean two micrometers of constant composition. And then you put an 18 nanometer germanium quantum well. You put a 20 nanometer silicon germanium barrier. And you finish with one nanometer of silicon. The reason of that is germanium oxide is extremely nasty. So even if you dip it in water, it can dissolve. So when you do fab, it's completely uncontrollable, and you prefer to, to finish with something which you can control. So this is, uh, this is our device, and I want here to point out all the experiments in Delft are operated in accumulation mode, which means that they don't have carriers, and they need to, they need to apply negative gate voltage in order to accumulate holes in their structures. We operate in depletion mode, so our wafer is not doped, but there are carriers. We don't know why. We have been discussing with Delft a lot. We don't understand what's the difference because all the material characterization shows exactly the same thing. There is one difference in terms of, uh, in terms of growth. What they do in Delft, they start with silicon, then they directly put one micrometer of germanium, and then they go the other way around, and then they reduce uh, the germanium content. So it might be that in their case, somehow the band profile localizes all the holes in, in the germanium part which they have put, while we don't have it, and that's why we get the holes in the quantum well. We don't know. For us, it's good because it's easier to, you need less gates to, to make your structure working. That's a speculation, Elsa. An experimental, spe because there needs to be some difference. So that is an obvious difference between the two types of materials. But uh, I don't think that Next Nano really gave this out. So we don't know. The honest answer is uh, we don't know. But every wafer we work, there are carriers. So it's not that you know one wafer has, the other does not have. So it's reproducible. In, 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 no, in the valence band. Ah, in the valence. So you are already in the valence band, whereas they are in the... No, they are as well in the valence band. Okay. But no, they are not... They need to pull... Uh, they need to put negative gate voltage in order to populate the valence band. While we have already carriers in the valence band. Uh, and, okay, we don't know why. Yes, like yes, but, but so far they have been growing as well on silicon. So we don't really understand what the difference. I hope one day we will understand. 
that will be good so that we have a better control over the material as well. Yes, I mean, so if they don't have carriers at all, yes. that doesn't mean that they are at the, at the gap? It means they should be in the gap, yes. And then they need to apply an electric field in order to, to be able to have uh, carriers tunneling into the valence band, yes. Yes. Uh, but uh, it should depend a part of the growth uh, of the, the intermediate layer on the direction, on the growth direction. Both uh, Giovanni and Giordano grow on 100, which is the easier material because, okay, don't ask me why, uh, silicon, <coughs> uh, all our society bases on silicon 100. Uh, I don't know why, but that's the material which seems to be the highest quality. And, and for them, it's also much easier to, to, to grow. So apparently, at least Daniel Loss predicts that if you grow on 1, 1, 0, uh, spin orbit should be even stronger. But it seems not to be easy to grow on 1, 1, 0. Why? I don't know. But uh, no, I mean, there, there are different uh, ideas, but uh, this works. This works to give high quality materials, and that's, that's what we are working with. Uh, okay, this is our structure, and uh, since probably not many of you are spin qubit guys, or some of you are not spin qubit guys, let me just tell you how to operate a single triplet qubit. And uh, one information the first ever spin qubit was a single triplet qubit, it was realized by Jason Petta, at that time postdoc in Amir Jacobi's group, in gallium arsenide. When I look now back at that paper, I'm more and more impressed because with that bad material, they managed to make a qubit. That's really a lot of respect. So there are two ways to operate the qubit. The one is delta P based, which means here you have a double quantum dot. So that's actually Jason's uh, device. The important thing is either you have a difference in magnetic field on the left and in the right dot, or you have a G factor difference. And for electrons, G factor difference are negligible. So everybody was, was having a difference in the magnetic field. And that was the hyperfine interaction, which is random and you cannot control. That's why I respect so much that they managed to do qubits and do amazing physics. And we base on the, on the G factor difference between the two dots. So uh, the, the works on uh, silicon, they had a G factor difference of two two times 10 to the minus three. And I will show you that we had a thousand times larger G factor difference, which allowed us to do a, a rather fast single triplet qubit. Okay, yes. Okay, so here I will speculate again as an experimentalist. So our qubit is not operated with just one carrier in both dots. So the G factor depends on confinement because depending on the heavy hole, light hole mixing, so heavy holes have out of plane G factors 6 kappa. Kappa is a Latin ger parameter, which is 3.4 for germanium, which, which means you could have 20 out of plane. You never have 20. But in, in theory, you would have 20. And the in plane is 0.2. And if you would have a light hole state, out of plane, it would be 2 kappa. And in plane, it would be 4 kappa. So it would be 12. So now you can think by playing with that mixture of the heavy hole, light hole character of your wave function, you are able to tune uh, the G factor of every individual uh, dot, which is a blessing and a curse at the same time. It's a blessing if you love physics. It's a curse if you want to scale, because then your dots really need to be tuned. Yes? But that also means that if I, if I have some charge noise that, that, that like wobbles, the, the, wobbles the wave function a bit, then I would also have a wobbling G factor, right? Yes. No, no, it, there are challenges. Okay. Uh, th that is very clear. I mean, there are uh, spin orbit and heavy hole, light hole physics is a blessing and a curse at the same time. It depends what, what your motivation is. And that's why for me, if you want to do uh, spin qubit technology with holes, there is no way around using machine learning. And we are collaborating with Natalia Ares group in Oxford because the only way is that machines will need to take over. No human will be able to tune these things. Because here we are speaking, you need to look for sweet spots. 
where your G factor is, is not changing, or uh, in some cases you want it to be changing, but that's not for human operation. So it needs to be taken over by a machine. Uh, just to be clear, that, that's the way I see it. Beautiful physics, if you then think about scalability, you need to put machine learning, artificial intelligence, which honestly, in any case, I think whatever, uh, if you ever dream of a, of a useful quantum processor, you need to have machine learning and artificial intelligence. Well, it will not be... I think you will, like they have now, it's already using, when they try to escalate to more than two dots. No, no, and I think also Google, I mean, in all their experiments, they have already this algorithm. Sure. It's not that in superconducting community they don't have it. So I think that's the way to go. You need to look for a sweet spot, yes, yes. And there has been recently a paper from Grenoble where they, Silvano and Roman Moran have really shown that there are sweet spots where effectively they have checked how does the G factor change if you apply one electric field. So, for example, imagine that you would, uh, you would measure uh, the electron spin resonance of a single dot line and then you would wobble that electric field and that electric field and that electric field and ideally you would like to to see that it does not change and then you would fix the gate voltages in that that is a sweet spot so independently if there you would have charge noise fluctuating electric fields your qubit would not see it that's why for me it's machine learning i mean a human can do it for one dot but uh, you don't want to torture too much your students just a bit <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh, I'm very slow, I apologize for that. So let's, uh, let's see the energy diagram of a double quantum dot. I apologize if that is too trivial for you. I, I like to refresh it for myself. So, so you see here, th this is a double dot and either you can have two ch carriers on the left dot or one and one. And if now you, s at the moment we don't think about spin, we just think about charge. So if you plot the energy versus a parameter epsilon, which is that detuning. Uh, uh, obviously, in such a configuration, that is energetically favorable. In such a configuration, that is energetically favorable. And in principle, obviously, if you don't allow tunneling in between, there is a crossing. But uh, if now you put also the spin degree of freedom into the game, you need to say that, OK, here, that can be a singlet state, but it could be also a triplet state. And if you remember uh, quantum mechanics, uh, the singlet and triplet uh, are not degenerate due to exchange interaction. So the triplet state is higher in energy. We forget it. For all the relevant uh, qubits, it's too high in energy. So let's forget it. Let's, let's kick that out. Let's now switch on tunnel coupling. So it means that now we can, we can tunnel from 2, 0 into 1, 1. And that's now how the energy diagram will look like. Why did one uh, line survive now in between? Is because now we need also to take into account that also in the 1-1 one, one configuration we have singlet and triplets, but they are energetically very close or degenerate. And obviously due to spin degree of freedom, you cannot tunnel between a singlet and a triplet because you would need to change the spin. So that's why the, the plot looks like this. And okay, if you then switch on the magnetic field, the three triplets are splitting in energy, the singlet's not. And okay, let's rotate it 45 degrees because that's how I'm going to, to show you the graph. So effectively, that's the energy diagram of our double quantum dot which we use in order to do a singlet triplet qubit. And how does the operation go? You are here where you're in the two zero. And what we are going to do, we are going to pulse very fast, deep, deep uh, into the one one configuration where the singlet and triplets are not any more eigenstates. So what does it mean? You will have coherent oscillations. So you will allow your qubit to evolve for a bit and then you pulse back. And then you will see, am I still in the singlet state or have I become in a triplet state? And uh, okay, that's the experiment. It's a bit more, okay, experimentally a bit more complex because you need to combine fast pulses. You need to be able to read out. You need to be able to read out fast. So you connect your, uh, your uh, charge sensor to a, a, a reflectometry setup, which practically uh, checks how is the resistance of your charge sensor changing. And uh, as time is running, uh, effectively, let me just show you 
the results. So you can do X rotations at very, very small fields. So, and actually maybe here you don't see it. We have managed to make a single triplet qubit at 300 micro Tesla. And here you see that uh, already at, uh, at four milli Tesla, we can exceed 100 megahertz. So indeed we can do a very fast uh, single triplet qubit also at very, very small magnetic fields. And why do we like very, very small magnetic fields? Because if you love hybrid structures, uh, you might want to combine things. Uh, okay, I will start skipping some things in order to, to reach also the hybrid part. Uh, maybe very shortly what Jaime is, is working on at the moment. Uh, okay, we have developed the single triplet technology. Now we want to understand how good are also our loss de Vincenzo qubits. So now again, you, you see we have a triple dot. Why do we have a triple dot? Because we are pessimistic that one gate will always fail. So if you are lucky then and, and one of these or one of these gates fail, you always have a double dot available. And we need a double dot available just to read out the spin qubit. Now the spin is not composed out of two carriers, but of one. So uh, let's say the, the spin qubit is the left and uh, let's avoid some technical discussions. Okay, the important thing is we can do Rabi, Rabi sweeps versus frequency versus power. And uh, okay, just the, the, the point to, to keep in mind, we have T2 stars of above one microsecond. Actually, Jaime now has a T2 star of three microseconds. Our wafers, our quantum well is much closer to the interface compared to the latest results from Delft. So it means that the limitations of all spin qubits is not how buried is your quantum well in respect to the interface, but most probably it's our oxide. So that's just as a takeaway message. It's not that we need to, to bring it. Theoretically, you would say if everything else is perfect in your fabrication, the deeper you bring it, the better your qubit should be. Well, we see the same properties like the Delft people, and we are uh, three times closer to the interface. So it's not the interface per se the problem. And just to give a, an outlook what, what will be loaded on Tuesday in the fridge, this is a five quantum dot uh, sample with two chart sensors. And I'm very proud to say that I found it. <laughs> so let's see if it's going to work. Okay, so, so these are our attempts in, in terms of uh, uh, spin qubits. But okay, uh, there is also more. And what do I think when I say more? Okay, if you have a semiconductor and you can create hybrid devices, you can think of uh, Gatemon devices. You can look for Majorana zero modes or if you get too pessimistic about uh, the existence or uh, the realization of Majorana zero modes, uh, you can go to minimal Kitaev chains. And okay, I believe Germanium is uh, at least an interesting platform to, to work on it because we have proven, not just the community has proven that you can do beautiful dots. What are we missing? Okay, the challenge is the G factor that please keep in mind. We, that is a challenge we will need to address. And of course, let's see how good is the superconductivity we can induce. Uh, early days, that's a work of the, of the group of Charles Lieber, 2006. They used uh, core shell nanowires and they, they could induce uh, superconductivity with rather large ICRM products of 200. Uh, that's me, still a postdoc. These are the self-assembled nanocrystals which, go, which grow automatically when you grow. And okay, very proudly a couple of peak one pair critical current. So yes, not the greatest device you can ever have, but it shows that proximity in principle can work. Couple of years passed, and then we went into the era of planar germanium, and more or less at the same, uh, at the same years, the Delft group and the Grenoble group published uh, Joe fed devices in, uh, in planar germanium with ICRN products around 16. I think that's eight. And my group then started working on hybrid devices also on planar germanium. And uh, one thing we did is we decided to, to do a sandwich between aluminum and niobium in order to, to enhance superconductivity and magnetic field resilience. So you can already see that the ICRN product went uh, above 350. Uh, looking back, I, I hate myself that we did not insist to do tunneling spectroscopy measurements 
So I do not know how soft the gut might have become because we have put niobium on top. That is something we are going to do soon. And uh, that's the work of uh, Giordano's group. What they have done, they have, uh, they have anil platinum and platinum germanium silicon is a superconductor. And uh, they have realized the hard gap of around, let's say, plus minus 80 microelectron volt. When we, when we realized those devices, we were very happy. But then we realized that depending on who, who is the person who uses the etching machine before you, your recipe works or not. <laughs> and of course, that is very frustrating because we had good periods for three months. And then there were three or four months that my students could not get superconductivity. And you know, that's just one step when you make devices. When you want to do advanced devices, if the first step does not work and you can find it out just after one week of work, that's not the way to go. So we said, uh, okay, let's change our approach. And also with the, with the vision of Majoranas, right? With all this, why, why don't we see Majoranas or why some of us think that we don't see Majoranas? Uh, I guess you're aware of the, of the argument of Daniel's group that one of the problems is the metallization issue that in all the indium arsenide experiments, the superconductor is directly on top of, uh, of indium arsenide. So maybe indium arsenide is actually aluminized. So the G factor is low. The spin orbit is actually not so good as, uh, as you would like it to be. And uh, then our idea was, OK, let's try if that would work. So to start with our spin qubit quantum wells, but now instead of uh, having here 20 nanometers, let's start reducing it. Can we get tunneling or proximitization between aluminum and germanium with a tunnel barrier? That was the idea. By the way, Ramon, please stop me when, oh, I, should, oh. when I should finish. Or uh, feel free to leave when you get bored. So <laughs> I, I, I don't feel offended. So, uh, so now, again, that, that's, our, that's our structure. So uh, and with Marco, we decided. Uh, that he should jump also a bit on germanium. So what's the mobility now? The mobility, obviously, if you get very close to the surface, is much worse. So what you see here, what we call D5, that's, that's D. So D5 means that that is 5 nanometers. D8 means that that's 8 nanometers. So if you work with a D8 sample, so the mobility you would report is, because you, you, you report it always the highest value, at high carrier density would be 25,000, while the D5 sample has a rather, rather low mobility. But, uh, and this is the mean free path. So if you do a next nano simulation, just to get a feeling what's the band offset between germanium and silicon germanium, it's around 200 milli electron volt. Because that's important to see if tunneling works or not. And uh, what we then did, we send our samples. So we get the wafers, we cut them, uh, we ship them to Eindhoven. They do an HF dip. They run to their machine. They deposit aluminum at low temperature. They ship us back the material. We create Josephson field effect transistor devices, which kind of is, is that picture. And importantly, from the TM picture, there does not seem to be interdiffusion of aluminum neither into the silicon germanium nor in germanium. So we have reduced our uh, highest uh, temperature when we fab to 150 degrees. So we have dropped the temperature of the aluminum oxide. We do a plasma process. In principle, one can go even lower. But we believe that the, the aluminum, well, based on the experimental evidence, we do not touch. Aluminum does not touch germanium. So does it work? We were surprised, actually, that it worked uh, in the first shot, because that's very rare in my career. Typically, it takes very long time. So what you see here is just a Joe Fett device. This is a D5, and this is a D8. So uh, this is for different gate voltages. I think you can clearly see that we can tune uh, uh, the, the, the critical current or the switching current. And uh, OK, to our surprise, the ICRN product for uh, the sample D8 seems to be higher than for D5. I'm willing to have a long discussion about that. We don't know what the reason is. But if, as a naive experimentalist, I would say, OK, D8 should have a better gap than D5. That would be my first reaction. So let's do tunneling spectroscopy. 
So once more, the mechanism is we have a tunnel coupling between delta, which is the parent gap, and delta star, which is the proximity of germanium. And now what we do, we have two finger gates. And in principle, not, not in principle, here we have the non proximity germanium, which will tunnel into the proximity germanium, which will then tunnel to the aluminum, and from there we are going to measure the current. So this is D8, this is D5. You can see D8 has not a great gap. So we have one order of magnitude difference in uh, above gap and below, but if you go to D5, we have a hard gap. So sorry, eight and five. What, what's the, the yes, width yes, of this yes. So you can really engineer superconductivity by tuning how large, and that that is very reproducible because that's nothing we etch away. People who grow, you know, they can control uh, monolayer. You know, they can control uh, na sub nanometer, the 0.1, 0.2 nanometer. So that's something really one can now use as a knob to decide what is the superconductivity you want to induce. And the nice thing, or that's our interpretation, is that we see a double peak, which the one we attribute to delta star and the other to delta. And you know, while delta is around 200 something microelectron volt, which makes sense for a six nanometer thin aluminum film, for the, for the D5 sample, Okay, it depends, it depends always now what you define as a gap. Do you define the position of the peak? If you define the position of the peak is plus minus 150 microelectron volt. If you really look just the area where you really have no states, that's around plus minus 80 microelectron volt. So I would say we are not so bad anymore compared to 3.5 materials. So uh, then we said, okay, we can induce superconductivity. Uh, but remember, tunneling spectroscopy is always a bit a nasty technique. We experience it very strongly with, uh, with the indium arsenide nanowires. Also, uh, in the paper, uh, if you take, we, we will report in the paper also the data on that side, and there you have random dot formation. So we believe that, you know, when you pinch here the, the finger gates, it's not like in theory you would like to have that you just form a tunnel barrier, but you end up forming also a quantum dot there. So it becomes a zoo. That's why one of the ideas was, let's try to make superconducting resonators on our material. Okay, the motivation is twofold or uh, manifold. If we want to go towards gatemons, if we want to go towards spin photon experiments, we need to see if we can uh, develop microwave technology on our wafers. So this is, this is a sample where, you know, you start with your planar germanium, you etch away all your quantum well, and then you realize uh, a superconducting resonator. That's a so-called lambda overfall resonator. It's not so important. Effectively, it's one type of a superconducting resonator. That's the feed line. And uh, these are the measurements. So the green is the quality factor of your resonator without the germanium quantum well. It is not outstandingly great, but it is good enough to do all the spin photon coupling experiments you need. And now the interesting thing is, if we don't remove the quantum well, but we just fabricate on top, and we just etch away the quantum well in the area of the gap, you see that practically they are almost identical. So what is our interpretation? Our interpretation is that germanium has been perfectly proximitized. So it's not anymore a, lo a, a lossy material, because a superconductor is not lossy. And that's why we don't see within the experimental uncertainty, or we see a very, very tiny difference. While if now you, you do this on a sample which we call D60, so if now you really decouple the germanium quantum well from the aluminum surface, because that will not show superconductivity, suddenly you have put a lossy material below your microwave. And uh, for people who have not worked with microwaves, Electrostatic simulations show you that the electric field goes 5 to 10 microns down. So it means you are sensitive to everything which is rather deep. And 60 nanometers is definitely not so deep. And you already see that the quality factor becomes much lower. So that's for us an additional uh, check to see actually that our uh, induced superconductivity is very nice and that we can do interesting experiments 
in the direction of uh, hybrid semiconductor, semi superconductor, uh, superconductor qubits. That's especially for Ramon. So uh, I will show you what we have. So this is now a so-called Gatemon device. So what you have here is, again, the superconducting resonator, which is capacitively coupled to an island. And if you zoom here in, that's nothing else than a Joson junction. So that's our gate. So again, that's our structure. That's how it looks. Uh, it looks on a larger scale. So actually, we have two qubits here. This is the, the, the gate through which we are going to drive the qubit. And the first thing you want to do in such an experiment, you want to see if, if actually there is a qubit. And uh, what you do is uh, you, send, uh, you send a signal through your feed line which couples to your resonator. And if your resonator couples strongly to the qubit, you will, you will get an avoided crossing. And indeed, you can see a beautiful avoided crossing. Remember that when we change the gate voltage on the Joson junction, we change the critical current. And when you change the critical current, you change the frequency of your qubit. Because we are blind in some sense. And I don't show here details, but uh, how exactly you, you made your Joson junction that, uh, that your qubit will be within 4 to 8 gigahertz, which is the range where we can do measurements. That's a problem for experimentalists. Uh, uh, but OK, the qubit exists. Then what do you want to do? You want to read it out in, dispersive, in the dispersive regime. So if your qubit now is uh, smaller in frequency than the resonator, and if now you sweep the power, what you see is what uh, what people in the superconducting circuit community do from, uh, and OK, the argumentation to me is a bit vague whenever I speak to them. What they say, when you, when you are in high power, you kill your qubit. So what you actually see is just the resonator. And the moment that you reduce the power you send, your qubit becomes alive. It's not killed anymore and leads to the dispersive shift. So that is a fingerprint for the superconducting circuit community that there is dispersive shift between your resonator and the qubit. And then you will, you will sit there, and you will send a second tone through the drive in order really to realize what's the frequency of your qubit. And if you do these two-tone spectroscopy measurement, that's what you get. So once more, you measure through this, and you drive through your gate. And uh, what you see here is actually a double peak. Why do you see a double peak? Because when you work with gate tunable uh, transmon qubits, the anharmonicity is very small. The big advantage of spin qubits is you know, that the next level is very far away. That's what they have shown also in the Copenhagen paper. So that uh, at low power, you would see just the transition 0, 1. And if you crank up and you have two photon processes, you get a second line. And OK, then you can map out the qubit frequency versus uh, gate voltage. As I told you, our qubit is gate voltage tunable. And OK, just let's, as time is passing, that's the harmonicity versus gate voltage. So we go from 50 to 200. Uh, interestingly, maybe Ramon, we can discuss about that. It seems to go in the opposite direction, because we would believe that when we push the gate voltage positive, our transparency should become lower. We don't fully understand it. And let me, I will show you just one Rabi plot. It's not very beautiful. We have some technical issues, which we don't know what it is. So, but OK, the qubit is alive, and we are working on material issues. I don't know what it is, but uh, uh, I hope that we can improve, uh, we can improve the properties. Uh, OK, then I will skip that. Uh, maybe just. To let you know, if you want to do spin photon experiments, your resonator to be, needs to be a high impedance resonator. Mm -hmm. We are working with granular aluminum materials like Ioan Pop reported yesterday. We can have a characteristic impedance more than 10 kilo ohms. Uh, OK, we, see, we start seeing indications of spin photon. So effectively, what you see here is that you, you are able to measure the double quantum dot through your resonator. And that's the first step if you want to, to do uh, different type of experiments. And I will just finish on the work we are uh, working together with, with Ruben. So they, they, 
they have a proposal that if you realize a squid <coughs> device, you should be able to, uh, to realize a, a, a diode. And that's what Marco has been, has been working on. So that's our, our squid device. And uh, if then you measure the, we have been measuring the retrapping current, but that does not make sense. That, that does not change anything. Effectively, in a standard squid, like we learned it at university, is uh, there is no shift between the minimum and maximum. Uh, and uh, if the two currents, if the two currents among these two branches are the same, the, that point should drop to zero. If you have either higher harmonic terms or a very high inductance, then you can have a so-called uh, superconducting diode effect. Uh, so, you know, uh, the difference is that now you sweep, in a, in a standard experiment, you would sweep your current from negative to positive, but if you want to see the diode effect, obviously you need to sweep from zero to positive and from zero to negative so that you always record both the switching current and not in one case the switching current and the retrapping current because else you have hysteretic effects. So that's our, that's our efficiency. So we could get efficiencies of, let's say, around 10%. By switching on an RF signal, we can reach an efficiency of 100%, but that I will not, uh, I will not focus on. As a last point is, uh, if you go through the equations describing a squid, you can find a sweet spot where effectively you kill the sine phi term. So you, you should get two phi terms, which would indicate that you have tunneling of pair of Cooper pairs. And if that is true, if you do Shapiro measurements, you should see fractional steps. And that's the last experiment which Marco did. So now we send also a, a drive. And if now you measure the differential resistance versus the current and the power, and it's actually easier to, to plot it uh, versus uh, the potential and power. You see that when you are uh, not balanced, which is the regime where you would not expect to kill uh, the single pair Cooper per tunneling, uh, you see just uh, integer Shapiro steps. And the moment that you, that you go to the uh, balanced regime and you are at half lux quantum, you see the appearance of a, of a fractional Shapiro step, which could indicate that indeed we managed to kill, uh, to kill that. And okay, I think I've been by far already beyond my time. Just my conclusion, we are 75 years after the invention of the transistor, which was based on germanium. And uh, that's the review article we wrote with, uh, with uh, Giordano and Mano Welthorst. And that's a figure which finally did not make it to the paper. But I think it is very nice because it shows starting from a silicon wafer, you can work with spins, you can work with superconducting system, and you can work with topological system. At least you can, you can look for it. So I'm very much convinced that we have entered a new era of germanium in quantum information. And uh, obviously, we have been collaborating with a ton of people. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>